All right, guys, welcome. We are going to begin our look at the A Push curriculum uh, with topic 1.2. So, period one, which this is, of course, part of, is all about the interaction between Native Americans and the earliest European settlers. But before we even get to European settlers, what we need to do is take a look at how North America, um, how, what it looked like, what it, how it existed prior to Europeans even arriving. So we're going to go kind of region by region and figure out how do these Native Americans uh, actually adapt to their local environments. So we have a guiding question we're going to be looking at uh, throughout this topic. And the guiding question is, how did Native Americans interact and adapt to the natural environment in North America? So we've got North America, of course, right here. You can see all the different little uh, regions and uh, just the dominant economic activity. And we're going to explore some of this as we go through these topics. Now, before we get to the individual regions and groups, we need to first, of course, get the Native Americans here. That requires a little historical contextualization. Now, you've learned about this before. I know in the past at some point, um, historians believe that the Native Americans arrived on uh, the North American continent uh, via Asia. Okay, so basically from what we would call Siberia today, they walked across this land bridge known as Beringia uh, during the most recent ice age, probably about 30,000 years ago or so, and they simply moved south, south, south until they had basically begin to settle all of North, Central, and South America. Now, the reason they're able to get here is because during the ice age, so much uh, the world's ocean water was locked up in these huge glaciers. And because of all that water level locked up in ice, the water level of the ocean itself dropped, exposing what is today um, shallow sea. So you take the water away, you've got land, and they're just walking across. And probably following uh, the path of animals that they were using as food sources. So we're going to look at our, begin our look at North America by talking about the Southwest. So the Southwest, think of places like modern day uh, Arizona, New Mexico, parts of Colorado, Utah, California, Texas. Um, if you've ever been to this area down here, you know uh, what we're looking at. It's hot, it's dry, much of it is, is very uh, deserty. Um, and so uh, this probably not a logical place, I wouldn't imagine, for a, a growing civilization, but they did thrive. And they thrived largely because of the crops they were growing. Maize, which we know better, of course, is corn uh, coming up from Mexico. So maize cultivation spread, of course, uh, across, rather, uh, North and South America. Now, the, the maize or corn we're used to is a very different substance than what the Native Americans would have been used to. Um, theirs was kind of like in the natural environment. Ours has been all kind of you know bioengineered and everything else. So our corn is quite different, but it's the same process. You're going to grow a crop. This allows people to settle permanently, have a reliable source of food. Uh, speaking of corn, uh, we grow tons and tons and tons of corn in America today. And if you really are interested in learning more about corn, you can check out the Corn Palace. It's in South Dakota. Um, it's on the way to Mount Rushmore, so it's kind of a big tourist stop. And every year, they change the outside decorations, and these decorations are made out of corn. Yeah, corn. So staying with the Southwest, um, we mentioned lots of maize slash corn growing. The way they're able to do this in this dry environment is through irrigation. So uh, you're going to have irrigation uh, projects all across the Southwest, which allow these settlements to pop up despite the arid environment. Uh, people like the Pueblo, people like the Anasazi, and uh, some of these you know, settlements you can see the remains of today. Um, probably the most famous of these would be uh, Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde um, down here in southwestern Colorado, not too far away from the, the four points where the four states meet. Um, you can see just, I, mean, I, I think this is evidence of pretty advanced civilizations uh, compared to all the other um, lack of remains we see across North America. Here we have something that's uh, uh, more or less permanent. All right, so our next region is going to be uh, kind of a, a double region. We're going to look at the Great Basin over here and the Great Plains over here. And the Great Basin, uh, first of all, the word basin, think of kind of like a bowl. 
you know, think of some old people used to, you know, they would call a, a sink a wash basin. So what it refers to is the fact that you're between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada, and you're down in this bowl-shaped area. Um, it is an area that's it's pretty dry, uh, not necessarily deserty type dry, but still uh, largely grassland, sparsely uh, populated. And the people had to survive um, not through settled farming like down the southwest, but by hunting and gathering and migrating. So you have a largely mobile population in these areas, particularly in the Great Plains, of course. These grasslands, what they're hunting is the bison slash buffalo. We would call it buffalo bison, whatever you want to call it. it uh, these things, uh, there were literally millions of bison across the Great Plains uh, during their peak. And you can see uh, just you know the environment. It's it, not a lot of trees because it's pretty dry out there, uh, but enough rain for the grass to grow. The bison eats the grass and the Native Americans eat the bison. So it's a bit of a food chain of sorts. Uh, now, the, the picture is a little misleading though, of course, because this painting is from much later. The Native Americans did not have access to horses, so they did not hunt on horseback. Um, horses come later with the Europeans. So imagine uh, being on foot and having to take down a thousand pound uh, bison. And by the way, you don't have a gun because guns are also something that come with the Europeans. So uh, certainly it takes a lot of effort and bravery uh, to do that. So. Again, it's not important that you remember every last individual name of these different groups across the middle of America or anywhere in North America, uh, but some of them you have heard of. You've heard of the Cheyenne, you've heard of the Sioux, you've heard of the Arapaho, Apache, Navajo, Hopi. These are all pretty well-known names. Um, one you may not have heard of, though, I thought I'd share with you, um, the Flathead Indians. Flathead now that's a term that uh, the Europeans gave, and they gave the European uh, the Europeans gave them that name, a nickname because of this well feature. And you're like, well, where did that come from? Well, it comes from this actually. So uh, in their in their particular culture, uh, they believe that this shape of head was uh, desirable, and so the uh, the young kids would actually have their heads shaped in that manner because a child's head is is believe it or not, it's actually kind of malleable. It's not totally formed yet. And so they would, they would basically press this down and shape the head like this. So as we head away from the Great Basin slash Great Plains, now we're going to move into the Northeast, the Mississippi Valley, and the Atlantic Seaboard. And uh, this is a different environment than we saw in the Great Plains or Great Basins where uh, you know, it was, it was largely grassy, grassy and uh, relatively dry. Um, as you cross the Mississippi, it gets, um, the, the climate gets uh, milder, it gets wetter, and you're going to be able to have settled farming. So instead of hunting and gathering, although you will still see hunting and gathering, you'll also see uh, little communities popping up um, all across the, the coastline and along the rivers in particular. And, uh, and that's, again, that's different from the, the largely mobile lifestyle in the Great Basin and Great Plains. So one name you're going to hear uh, with some regularity in the next couple of sections uh, would be the Iroquois. And the Iroquois are not actually a single tribe. It's a confederacy of different tribes from upstate New York. And you can see how the Iroquois have adapted to the environment. They've, they've they formed a shelter, a permanent shelter, so they're not mobile. They're not, uh, you know, running across the landscape looking for food. They're they're going to be growing corn and other uh, other vegetables to survive, along with, of course, supplementing that with hunting. And the Iroquois longhouse is evidence of that settled farming. Now, in the Midwest, you'll also see lots of mound building civilizations, and they. Uh, they were called that, of course, because of the mounds that they constructed. You'll see these all across, um, you know, modern-day Ohio. You'll see some even here in Tennessee. Uh, and the one I thought I'd share with you is probably the most famous of these mounds. It's the Great Mound at Cahokia. And this is a picture of it today. This is a painting done of what their civilization may have looked like. If you ever get a chance to go see it in real life, it's it's just east of St. Louis. Um, it's really impressive. I mean, it is a va it's huge, huge mound. Uh, it's it's a bit of a walk up to the top. Uh, when you get up to the top, though, you can actually see if you look 
uh, out, you can actually see St. Louis. I mean, you can see the arch and the downtown area because it's, again, it's not that far away from the Mississippi River. It's just east of St. Louis and a um, very impressive site. Uh, the mound builders survived, like we talked about, with a lot of people from the southwest and also the northeast is through growing maize. Our last region is going to be nor the northwest, the Pacific Northwest, and also the California coast. And this area has a pretty mild climate. Um, it's going to be wetter in the north and drier in the south, but again, very mild temperatures, uh, very mild winters. You're not going to see any snow in Southern California or something like that. Um, here you have a mix of, of settlements. You're also going to see hunting and gathering. So kind of a lot of the different features we saw from various other places, we're going to see a lot of all of those things kind of put together. Um, and what makes the Northwest and the California coast uh, unique, uh, at least compared to the Great Basin or Great Plains or something like that, would be the fact that they're on the Pacific Ocean and they have vast ocean resources, uh, hunting, uh, fishing, whaling, all these at their disposal. In fact, this is uh, fish being dried for preservation. The ocean really is their key to life. So we've gone through all the different regions of North America. We've talked about uh, the individual kind of conditions in the natural environment. We've talked about how the Native Americans had to learn how to adapt to these conditions and how those adaptations uh, shape their culture and their society. So this is the situation where we have in North America prior to European intervention. And we're going to look at European involvement in the North American colony, or excuse me, North American territories in our next video.